everyone. My name's Tom, and I'm the interim pastor here at New Era Reformed Church. I'd like to welcome you here today to worship the Lord. We're going to have a great day together. I just have one announcement uh, before we begin our service, is that immediately following the service, we're going to give you a chance to get some coffee uh, and then come back right back into the um, auditorium. We're going to have a congregational meeting uh, to vote on the recommendation of the consistory to call Pastor Ben Oliveira to be our pastor here at New Era Reformed Church. And so get your coffee and, and come back in as soon as you can, and we'll get that meeting going. Other than that, let's stand and say hi to someone around us. <clears throat> we hear these words from the Gospel of John, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning. We're going to raise our voices in song this morning. Uh, join us as we sing. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, and mourns in lonely exile here, until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for that, uh, that reminder that you came to us. You gave up your only son for us. And you sent him to a lowly stable in a manger to save us from our sins. Lord, help us to stay focused on that during this wonderful Christmas season, this Advent season, that you are the reason we celebrate. Help us to forget the things of this world and to focus on those heavenly things above. God, you are good. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in our congregational prayer at this time. So let's, uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we serve a Savior that has come and that is coming again. That he's coming again in glory to right all injustice, to gather his people to his arms, to end suffering and death forever. We thank you for the hope of eternal life that we have through Jesus. We thank you, God, that you're not a, a God that is remote and distant and cold and uncaring, but that in this Advent season, as we think of the birth of Jesus, you came near. You reached out to us. Your arms are wide open, welcoming us to you, no matter who we are, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done. The Lord Jesus has welcomed us, and we are so grateful today for that. We also come during this Advent season with joy because this season gives us extra hope. When we think on these wonderful things, Lord, our burdens seem to be lighter. Our confusion seems to become clarity. Our pain begins to soften. And so today we pray, God, for each of us here today that we will continue to turn to you and let the power of your Spirit touch our lives in all its fullness. Lord, we pray you will create life in us where there's emptiness and pain. We pray that you will give healing where we have been broken, and we will give you praise. God, this morning we want to bring some of the concerns of our own church before you. We want to pray for Lynn James, who has suffering with cancer, and she has difficult chemotherapy to experience. God, we pray the Spirit of God will bring healing to Lynn and that you will comfort her and be close to her during this difficult period of chemotherapy. God, we also want to pray for Margaret Amstutz this morning, who is going through uh, clinical trials for colon cancer, and we ask for healing uh, for her. Lord, today we also want to give thanks for the ministry of Phil with our youth, for the hard work and the good work that Phil has done, for the relationships that have been built. We give you thanks, and especially for the lives that have been touched in the name of Jesus. We pray your blessing on Phil and his family, that you will encourage them. Lord, we also lift our eyes to the horizon, and we think of our neighbors in our community. We pray for the churches of our community that they would be blessed by you, that you will help them to be productive and fruitful in the ministry that you've called them to. We also, Lord, think of our world and we think of the war in Ukraine that continues. We pray that the war would cease, that there would be peace, that the injustice would stop. 
And so guide our leaders and the leaders of the nations, especially the leaders of Ukraine, to have wisdom, Lord, in that uh, particular situation. Again, we give thanks uh, for this hour. We pray that you would now receive our gifts and bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have our offering at this time. Home is where the heart is. Or so the saying goes. Home is a place of safety and rest. Home is a place for peace. A space where we can be our truest selves. We renovate old homes to make them new. We build dream homes so we can live in comfort and at ease. We search cities and neighborhoods to find a place to rent or buy. We search cities and neighborhoods for a safe place to live with the people that we love. Home is where the heart is. And today on this day of Advent, we remember that God came to dwell among us. To make a home with us. And this gives us great reason to hope. Home is where God's heart is. And God's heart is always with us. The story of this hope is thousands of years old. We live in a day where that hope is reality. However, the home is not a place of hope, safety, or peace for so many. Ever since God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day to fellowship, the dream home that God designed for us has been attacked. And it was our sin and disobedience that seemed to dash all the hopes of home forever. Sin brought enmity, strife, and discord between spouses and siblings, families and neighbors, ever since man's first disobedience. We wrecked the home that God gave. But God sent his son Jesus into the world to salvage our hope and to make a home again for all who believe. As Jesus lived his life on earth, as he revealed the Father, and as he went to the cross to defeat sin and death, he restored the hope of humanity. Jesus promised us that if anyone loves me, he will obey my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and take up residence with him. And so on the first night of his life on earth, among the cattle and the sheep, among the bales of hay and the barnyard smells, at the manger, Mary and Joseph had a home. For Christ the Savior of the world was present with them. Wherever Jesus is, the Father is with him and he establishes a home. Today, as we light the candle of hope, we remember that our true home is not in a building. We remember that our true home is not a space with a roof and four walls. Our home is with Christ in God. As we prepare our hearts for Christmas, we remember our true home. Today, we come to the manger to experience true hope. Lord, it is our prayer that you, uh, you take this song and you stir our hearts, you stir our minds as we sing and worship you this morning. for a miracle the heart longs for a little bit of hope oh come oh come Emmanuel a child prays for peace on earth and she's calling now from the sea of her oh come oh come Suffering, he is Messiah, the 
Psalm 113, let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. The name of the Lord is to be praised. Father God, we ask that you take this offer of worship that we bring to you with humble hearts as an adequate, a more than sufficient balm to the love that you give to us and we give it back in return. Open our hearts and our minds to hear the stories that you proclaim to be your truth and that we live our lives by. Bless Tom as he brings your words. Bless us as we receive them. In the great Savior's name, amen. Um, our scripture lesson today comes from Luke Chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. If you have your Bibles, if you want to, there's a few Bible. You can turn in that or you can follow along on the screen as we read together. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel said to her, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from the Lord will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is the word of God, and may there be praise in the church because of it. 
what I maybe entitled the message today, The Merry Miracle, or I Wish You a Merry Christmas, um, whatever, I'll give you a choice. You can make your own title up for that, that particular theme. It was a beautiful summer day, and a police officer pulled over a car for speeding. The officer approached the driver's window, and the window went down, and the police officer said, could I please see your driver's license? And the guy driving the car said, well, I don't, don't have a driver's license. I've had, just got my fifth DUI, and uh, they won't give me a license to drive anymore. Well, could I please see your uh, registration and proof of insurance? And he said, well, um, it's not my car. Uh, you see, I stole it. <laughs> and the officer said, well, could you please get the real owner's registration so I can look at it? And and uh, the guy said, well, I think I saw it when I opened the glove compartment and I put the gun in there that I used to shoot the lady and stuffed her body in the trunk um, before you pulled me over. And the cop said, you have a gun in there? Yeah, that's right. There's a body in your trunk? Yes, that's right. Well, the police officer was really concerned. So he go went back to his car. He called his captain. And before long, the captain was there and the the automobile in question had been surrounded by other police officers, and so the captain thought he, being a veteran of the force, would take control of the situation. And uh, he, he walked up, and, he, and the captain said, Sir, may I see your driver's license? And the guy hauled out um, his driver's license, and he said, Here it is. And the captain said, Wow, that's valid. The captain said, Well, whose car is this? Well, it's mine, officer. Here is the registration and the proof of insurance. And the captain said, well, could you please slowly open the glove box? Because uh, I've been told by the other officer that there's a gun in there. And then could you open the trunk? Because I was told there's a body in there. The guy said, sure. He opened up his glove compartment. There's no gun in there. He opened up the trunk and there's no body in there. The captain came back and said, I don't understand it. The officer who stopped me said, you told him you didn't have a license, you stole the car, you had a gun in the glove box, and that there's a dead body in your trunk. The guy said, yeah, I'll bet you he told you I was speeding too. <laughs> so, I wonder, when Gabriel appeared to Mary, if she felt confusion. I wonder if she was baffled at all, like, this story just doesn't make any sense to me. Today's passage comes to us from the book of Luke, and as Luke writes the Advent story, he goes into quite a lot of detail. Maybe you noticed that as we were reading the passage. I think one of the things we run into is uh, some of these stories. I, I, I've read that story since as long as I can remember. And I don't know about you, but it's just so easy to put one's mind in neutral and kind of cruise through it and not ponder really how significant those details are in the incredibly good news uh, that they have for our lives today. So I want to take a few minutes this morning and consider a few of these things uh, that are important found in Luke 1, and um, let's talk about this Mary, this Mary miracle. I think the first thing to notice that we should take heart from is this, that God, the, the kind of people that God uses in this Advent story. We hear of Elizabeth, who her whole life has not been able to have a child, and, not, and she's elderly, and now she's in her sixth month, ready to give birth to John the Baptist. We think of a man like Joseph, who would become Mary's husband, who was a humble carpenter, there was nothing famous about Joseph. And then, of course, we consider Mary herself, who probably was 14 or 15 years old, most scholars think, when Gabriel appeared to her and announced that she was going to give birth to the, the Savior of the world. It was, it was Mary's commonness. Uh, it was Mary's humility and love for God that I think is the reason she was chosen to give birth to the Savior. There's nothing about her brilliance. There's nothing about all the gifts she has or what a dynamic leader she might be. But she was a humble servant girl who loved God. And it was that commonness, I think, for all of these folks that I just mentioned. 
And that should hearten us today because God uses people, common people, uses everyday people like you and me to serve his kingdom. Luke 1, 30 and 33, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus. He'll be great and called son of the Lord most high, uh, son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Now the really astonishing thing about this passage is not Mary's youthfulness, but that she was a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Now, uh, engagement in those days was a more significant thing. That en- I mean, engagement is significant in our culture, but even more so in those days. I mean, it would take an act of divorce uh, for uh, this relationship to be ended. The only thing that yet remained was for them to live together and for their relationship to be consummated. So they're on their way to getting married. And suddenly, Gabriel appears to her and he tells her she's going to conceive a child, even though she's still a virgin. She must have been nearly in a state of shock. And and she says, I mean, her mind must have been racing. She says, how can this be? She said, I'm still a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now friends, as we break this down, we make a big mistake if we only look at Mary's virginity in terms of innocence and purity. Mary's virginity did not provide an earned holiness to which God might respond with a miracle it didn't make her deserving of it. It does not, re- but what her virginity, we need to see here, I think, really represents is the utter impossibility, humanly speaking, of life coming forth from this woman's womb. It's impossible for life to come forth. We need to see her situation as one of impossibility, one of weakness, one of hopelessness, and miraculously, because the grace of God, the seed of God, entered the womb of this young woman, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, life was born in the dark pocket there in her womb, which was sealed off. Light in life entered, and the darkness began to breathe with life, and Jesus' heart was beating. Now, friends, I think that all of us, like Mary, have pockets of hopelessness in our lives. And we make a big mistake today if we think that um, God will only get, grant us blessing and healing, or God will even use us if we're innocent and pure and untouched, then most of us will give up and go home because it's not the case. You see, no one ever called by God in the Scriptures reports for duty with a clean slate. All right, No one shows up with, without uh, any, any sin or mistakes in, uh, in their lives. And so, The encouraging thing is no matter how solid we may think we are, we are never beyond the grace and power of God to heal and to use us. And and, um, great things can happen. This is the most encouraging part, I think. Can you see yourself in Mary's situation? Perhaps there's a dark pocket. Perhaps there's a wound uh, in your life. There's a a hopeless situation. And, And we think it's impossible for God to do a miracle, for God to make a difference in my life. And yet the Mary miracle is something that God tells us is available to each of us. But there's one catch here. For God to work in our lives, the one thing that Mary had to do was acknowledge her inability to have a child, her brokenness. It required that Mary identify that dark place in her life where there was no life. And and in fact, I think the truth is for us is when we finally abandon the facade that we're competent, that we're worthy, that we're deserving, then God can really get to work in our lives. When we have nothing to bring to the table except, Lord, I'll follow you. I think the Holy Spirit really can impact our lives and and touch us and use us in wonderful and powerful ways. You know, the first step 
of Alcoholics Anonymous says this, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and our lives had become unmanageable and we believe unless we acknowledge this shattering truth, there's no hope for us to be healed. For God works in our places of brokenness, that personal poverty pocket of our own experience. That's where the riches of our God can enter and bless our lives in wonderful ways. So first of all, this morning, where is it in your life? Where does God need to fill you with life and with hope? Now, a second thing I think is very evident from this passage is that God is in control, God has a plan, and nothing's going to stop it. God is sovereign, that plan's going to come to fruition. Isaiah 55, 9 through 11 says this, declares the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts higher than you, your thoughts. For just as the rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return without watering it, making it bud and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, so my word that proceeds from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and it will prosper when I send it. The word was with God in the beginning. The Word was God, and the Word of God became flesh. So how did God demonstrate His power and sovereignty in this passage? Well, first of all, He sent the angel Gabriel at the appointed time to an appointed place, to an appointed person that God had chosen for that moment. God had it planned. Galatians 4, verse 4, uh, Paul writes, But in the fullness of time God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters of God. One pastor writes this, I want to encourage everyone. The Lord knows your address. He knows where you are geographically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. He knows every detail of your life. And so my friends, today, if God knows when the sparrow falls, don't you think He is aware of where you are at and what your need is and what your hope is during this Advent season. You see, you are just as important to God as Mary was. The Bible said God is no respecter of persons. God loves us all the same. He loves you and me as much as he loved Mary. Your name, our name, is on the lips of God. God has his stamp on us. He says, you are my children You belong to me. And uh, I think that's such such a powerful truth. You know, it's a truth that needs to be considered how God knows each of us. I I think today, you know, the the blessing, right, and the curse of electronics and media. It's amazing what it can do, but it's also amazing for how it is starved our culture of healthy lives because as we've become isolated uh, we've become more alone we've become more depressed we've become more discouraged and so we see right now i mean i'm not just saying this this morning we're they say culturally we're in the midst of a mental health crisis it's been so difficult we need to be encouraged because we're not just a file on a computer someplace that God has there. But God knows us by name. He knows us who we are. John 1, 40, uh, John, in the Gospel of John, we read this in John 1, 47. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming, he, he said of him, there is an Israelite who deserves the name incapable of deceit. How do you know me, said Nathanael. Before Philip came to you, Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. The Samaritan woman said this when she returned home. She said, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. Jesus knew her by name. On the road to Damascus, Jesus knocked Saul off his horse, his donkey, and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus knew Saul, became Paul by name. This would encourage all of us today, no matter where we are at in life, God knows the place we are residing in. He knows our needs, our concerns. He knows each of our names, and He loves each of us. We can rest in that today. The last several weeks, I 
have been going well, three, four times a week to Mary Freebed Hospital in Grand Rapids uh, for rehabilitation. I got lymphedema in one of my legs, and it's wrapped this morning. That's why it looks like it's 10 times bigger than my other one. But anyway, um, they have a lobby there where you go in. And there's this uh, wonderful lady there. Her name is Karen. And she runs that lobby. Man, I mean, she is in charge. Thing that is so cool. I walk in there at 7 a.m., she smiles. Hi, Tom, how are you today? She knows everybody's name that comes through that door. And it's just, I think, the coolest thing to walk in there, get a cup of coffee. Hey, Tom, how are you doing? Well, God knows more than our name. God knows us viscerally. God knows us internally and externally. God knows everything about it. All of our thoughts and hopes and dreams. And God embraces us. We belong to him. He knows our name. The last thing I want to share this morning is this. What if an angel of God came and met you face to face and had a conversation with you? What if he told you something so unbelievable that you couldn't wrap your mind around what he wanted to do. So Mary has this incredible conversation with Gabriel. Mary finds it difficult to believe. She's stunned at Gabriel's visitation, let alone the impossibility, the utter impossibility of this message. As great Gabriel greets her, it starts out this way, greetings to you, greetings to you who are highly favored of the Lord. The text says Mary was troubled by his words. She wondered what kind of greeting this was. The angel told her, but do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. The, the Greek verb translated highly favored is used only two times in the New Testament. And uh, it's used here in this passage regarding Mary, highly favored, and in Ephesians 1, verse 6, as Paul is talking about the status of the Christians in Ephesus before God, it's, it, he says, you are accepted and you are beloved of the Lord, Paul is saying. So Mary, we need to know, wasn't the only one favored by God. Because of God's grace, you are too, and I am too. The same thing that can be said of Mary because of the work of Jesus today uh, can be said of us. Second Thessalonians 2.13, but we should always, we always thank God for you, brothers who are loved by the Lord. You are loved by the Lord. You're here today. You are loved by the Lord. We have symbols uh, of his love, and uh, we're going to experience his presence as we share in the Lord's Supper. And that love and that grace and that mercy brings with it all of the possibilities of miracles and God working with strong power in our lives because His favor rests on us as His people. Highly favored. And because His Son died for us and He is our Savior, what great hope and calm that can provide our lives. Mary was trying to figure this out in her own mind. Now, keep in mind she was very young, 14 or 15. Um, an adult would, blown adult would be, yes, trying to figure this out as well. And I, here are my thoughts on this as she, she surrenders uh, to, to God. She says, well, okay. She says, let it be to me. That's another translation. Let it be to me according to your word, right? She hears this fantastic news. She doesn't understand how the miracle is going to happen. Wow. She says, okay, let it be to me according to your word. I don't think more courageous words were ever spoken uh, in, in the Bible. And so I think with Mary, we can at some point stop trying to figure out everything, what God's going to do. Uh, we, we can't help him. We can only be faithful and follow him and surrender to him. So God is calling us today to believe that his power and grace can rest upon each of us. Mary said that in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Then the miracle began to happen to her. 
Today, what does your heart hunger for? What is your need? What is the stress in your life? Where is the darkness? Where is the brokenness? What is God asking you to do during this season of your life and this year? Let us pray. Father, we give thanks today for this wonderful story. Gabriel's visit to Mary. The miracle that she conceived the Son of God as a virgin. Where there was no life in that womb, no possibility of it. The Spirit of God created life. Lord, we come to you today with all of us. Our sin, our brokenness, and and the healing we need. And we pray, God, that you will create life for us as you did for Mary. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yo 
A reminder, we'd like to get our congregational meeting going, maybe 10 minutes after we're dismissed. Grab coffee, restroom, whatever you need, and, and come back. Friends, you are blessed. You are deeply loved by Jesus. You've been splendidly gifted by His Spirit. As you go, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Have a great day, everybody.